It all began with this uh, man, his name is Rolf, he was like the, the big visionary of, of the whole project. And basically what was going on was that in Costa Rica we didn't have the option to be truly sustainable um, in terms of uh, buying our food and, and the things to, to support a sustainable lifestyle in the city. Pretty much all the food system was do dominated by intermediaries. Um, mainly supermarkets, and even in some of the farmers' markets, the, the farmers were pushed away by the inter intermediaries. So, um, he had a vision um, to create the most beautiful market we could possibly imagine. And that's kind of how we start our adventure together, you know, like really dreaming, you know, what is the most beautiful market you can possibly create. So, um, one of the... Um, uh, well, this is how it looks. It, it happens... We have two markets now. This is the one uh, happening every Saturday morning. And an important thing was that we wanted to create a food system where you could actually connect with the people that grow your food. So, we're talking about food with names and surnames. So, for example, this is Don Sergio. He's a, um, a traditional Costa Rican farmer. And every week, um, twice a week, uh, I have the opportunity to connect with him on a human level. So, it's not just the provider of my tomatoes. It's not an impersonal produce. It's actually a human relationship that I develop with them. So, um, we have about... 140 vendors at these two markets. Um, there are food artisans like Maggie, um, ranging from cheese, bread, um, all sorts of like a, a proce processed food, honey. Uh, we also have a whole section about. Um, restaurants where we serve traditional and more cosmopolitan food, ranging from, this is traditional Caribbean Costa Rican food uh, by Mariana. And we have other more like, you know, kind of like hipster bakers uh, uh, with, you know, like really innovative um, dishes. Uh, this is kind of like our food court where we put uh, tables together in a way that people are sort of forced to share and um, connect with each other. Because one of the very important things that we're promoting through this market is that you would create community. Um, this is another view of the um, food court. We also have all sorts of products ranging from cosmetics, uh, pottery, jewelry, design, uh, clothing. So basically, we're trying to create a comprehensive um, offer of all the things that you need to be truly sustainable in the city. Live music every single week. Um, this is a, a, so this view is from our Saturday market, and on Tuesdays evenings we have this other. Um, market in a different location. So here there's a, a full band playing. We also promote um, activism within the market because we see it a, as a, a place of encounter. So for example, this is a permaculture group doing uh, seed exchange, which is uh, very important now in, in these times where we have uh, such a push of corporate control over seeds. Um, these kind of grassroots movements are really promoting to preserve the diversity of seeds that we have inherited from thousands of years of uh, agriculture. This is another activism um, project called uh, Draw Your River, where we invite adults and children to draw how they would like to see the river, which is um, just behind this fence, there's one of the most polluted rivers in the city uh, running through. So it's a way to, to start uh, the conversation about like, the poor state of this uh, river in the city. And you can notice that you have like, 
childlike uh, drawings. And then in the upper level, you see a more elaborate adult. So the, the parents are also engaging in the same um, exercise. We have uh, activities for children on a regular basis, um, yoga classes, a hula hula club. We have a recycling center where people can also bring their recyclables and we take them then uh, pass it to like a proper recycling center. Because in our city, we don't have um, a proper recycling system. So we basically um, uh, decided to take it in, in our hands. And sometimes there's things as random as a shamanic ceremony. And we're also very open to all sorts of these kind of like uh, surprises. Um, to me, it's very important um, to say that this all happened out of a group of really committed um, citizens that we were not satisfied with the status quo of how the system was providing, you know, um, the, the food and, and the market in general, and, but we were completely ignorant of the, of the subject. We didn't know how to do it, we didn't have the resources, the expertise, and, and nonetheless, it was through creating this community of passionate people that we were able to um, create it. So, in a way that now, six years later, um, about 130 vendors in the first market, 70 vendors in the second market, about 3,000 um, consumers that we actually call them enjoyers. Uh, so 3,000 of them come to, the, to, to in a combined to these two markets, um, creating um, an economy that we estimate goes kind of in the three million dollar range a year. And this is all fair trade that is happening directly between co-creators and enjoyers. Um, and it's creating a very um, disruptive um, approach. I actually, I one time had one of the um, owners of uh, one of the biggest uh, supermarket chains telling me, like kind of joking, he was saying, Francisco, you guys should stop this uh, market thing. It's, it's terrible for business. And and I replied, well, I, I suppose it, it all depends. It's terrible for whose business, because my farmers are actually uh, thriving. Um, without even knowing, um, we unconsciously start hacking a lot of uh, the things to make this uh, market possible. So for example, we, we started with the structures, the, the tents. We thought, if you want an ecological market, then you need an ecological shelter. And this is our first uh, prototype. This is on, on, on the desk. And eventually, we did it with bamboo. Um, and these like, unions are bicycle tires. And these uh, uh, nuts over here are the inner tubes of, um, of uh, trucks that we cut in, in stripes and then uh, put it all together. This was the first time we we were like trying to build the one, uh, you know, like a real scale. And this is how they look now. So every week we put up and down about 70 of these uh, tents. And, and, we're, and for me, it's really important because it is also creating like a statement of what is it that we want. You know, it's, um, oh, by the way, the, um, the roofs are all uh, recycled billboards from those huge billboards in the street. Um, we end up uh, hacking our own tables because the, the commercial tables, one little thing breaks and then you have to discard the whole thing. So we thought, well, actually it's better if we build them ourselves. We create jobs in our local community and if they break, then we repair them ourselves. Uh, the tops are recycled uh, Tetra Pak um, material, and the rest is uh, wood. And then for the second market, we had this uh, big roof, which used to be like an old uh, marketplace, but we needed proper illumination system. So with a, a, a maker's uh, space, we designed these lamps. It, they are all um, laser-cutted, and 
and they are joined with a ba big bamboo stick here. So one end of the bamboo has like a, um, it connects to the next one kind of like in uh, like this Christmas light uh, kind of concept. And so we can connect 150 lamps in a matter of an hour and a half. And then we were inspired by organic shapes. So for example, this is the onion lamp. This is the strawberry lamp. This is the squash lamp. And, thi and this one here is the cacao lamp. So we were all, you know, like doing our own um, hardware uh, that really suits our purpose and that gives us control. If it, it's, if it breaks, then we do it ourselves. Um, reflecting on what we did, and again, we did this just because we uh, felt that, you know, like longing, that desire. But now, looking back, and, and when I was preparing <clears throat> for the talk, I realized, like, oh my god, we were also hacking the way we do things, you know? So, um, this for me, it's a very important one, the burning heart. Um, so, typically, if you have like an NGO or any kind of organization, you need a director's board, which has a president and a secretary, a treasurer, and blah, blah, blah. We were just a group of like kind of dreamers and we wanted to create something new and disruptive. So w at the beginning, we didn't have a director's board. We just simply gathered. And so a group of really passionate people came together every week and discussed what is it that we want for the market? Um, where should we take it? You know, like all the big decisions were done in this group. And we self-proclaimed the, the group as the burning heart because we were the ones like keeping that, the kindle, the, keeping the fire. And it's just basically a group of friends. Then we realized that we were starting to get in trouble with the system, you could call, because, um, you know, years have gone by. We don't have a director's board, our legal... Um, like the legal side of our organization is failing to comply a lot of things that the state is uh, demanding. So we basically came with this uh, idea of being bilingual. And I think that is a really important thing in the context of hacking because we're trying to create these parallel um, systems, but the, at the end of the day, we live in a official system, you know, like we physically speaking, we are also embedded in what we call Babylon. So we had to translate from heart language, which is burning heart, to Babylon language, which is director's board and, you know, like um, uh, uh, tax forms and uh, the... Um, Oh my God, I don't have the word in English, but all the legalities that you have to comply to be in peace with the government. And so that is kind of like the, the Babylon language. So in practice, Burning Heart is the one who takes all the important decisions. And then once a month, we have uh, a proper uh, director's board who basically um, writes down in legal tender all the decisions that were done by the burning heart. And then the burning heart is a much more open uh, figure for people to get involved. Um, then we have a, a management structure where we don't have like a, a boss. Uh, so what we did was we, we had our team and we said, okay, so each one will um, take certain responsibilities, so you have your area of focus and then you will work on that, but then we would come together and we would all discuss like, hey, uh, for example, I was in operation, so I was in charge to make sure that the, you put up and down the tents, that the tables are all right that, and so on. But if I have any question or I didn't feel sure about what decision to make, then I would go to my management team and say, hey guys, you know, like, I'm having this dilemma, what do you think about it? And so we, we kept this very horizontal way of uh, self-organizing. This guy over here is like, he's an angel. He's the, the, the one in charge of physically putting up and down the, the, um, the two markets. And it's one of the hardest jobs I've ever witnessed. So we 
came up with this mission, which is to create spaces of encounter taken care of uh, with values of sustainability and well-being. So we were saying, you know, like, now the market is this abstract thing that seems to be governed by, uh, solely by money, you know, like, if it makes money, it's okay, and if it doesn't, it's not. And, and we felt that that is profoundly dysfunctional. So we came with this idea that money is not a value. Money is just a tool. And if you use it as a value, then you pretty much get in the mess that we're in right now. Um, so we proposed a series of values which are kind of like our, the criteria of how we allow people to come into the market. And basically, this is what we expect from them. So locally co-created, proper scale, uh, the commons, open sourcing, celebration, family agriculture. I'm not going to go through all of them. You can... Activism. I really like this, the delicious. You know, it's so important to, to bring this kind of quality to our lives. And it's not just about money. It's not just about, you know, which one is a better deal and, and so on. It's more about what is creating a truly sustainable lifestyle based on well-being, you know, because at the end of the day, it's about being happy. So years come pass by, and then again, looking back, we were like, man, like, this... This project is so much more than just selling. It's so much more than just the market. So we came up with uh, um, these philosophical principles that reflect the work that we had been intuitively doing. Um, so the first one, uh, it, 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 there is no order of importance, uh, uh, is abundance for everyone. We live, it, it, our current system is so discriminatory and basically pushes so many people to the, to the edges of poverty and, uh, and we think that's not all right, you know, like we want to live in a, in, a, in a system where everybody has access to abundance, you know. Um, we, we're not egalitarian, but we do believe that there's a certain level that we should all have access to a dignified life. Um, Concordance in diversity means that we can recognize that we can be extremely different from one another, but at the same time, there's so much common ground, and we can start working from that common ground and uh, uh, moving forward. The power of encounter, and this is one thing that I've been amazed uh, to see in this Congress, which is if you bring a lot of people together with shared values, especially if you do it on a regular basis, then that's where real power happens. That's where, you know, where ideas, um, friendships, business, romance, uh, everything, you know, like really starts kind of like resonating because you become part of that tribe and you recognize each other. Uh, and that is really where we see power happening. The politics of desire. So instead of complaining about what we lack, what, what, what we don't have, the things that are wrong, which have a space. I mean, I'm not a, like um, undermine, saying that that is uh, completely wrong to do, but what we're saying is that we feel that it's a much better approach to identify what are our true desires. You know, wh where do we want to, to get? And from that point, ex exercise politics, which is basically relating to others to make that happen. And reverence for the spirit of the earth, because at the end of the day, absolutely everything comes from the earth. You know, like, if you look around, there's nothing that doesn't come from the earth. And if we don't start treating earth with some, like, uh, respect and even reverence, then the sustainability movement, in my opinion, is, is lost. You know, like we, re we have to redefine the way that we relate to, to Mother Earth. So, as you see, I come from this more analog 
hacking uh, uh, world. And, uh, but I've been very inspired to be here and see so much potential and, and enthusiasm. So I thought, you know, what are the things that I really would love to see being implemented and then creating this bridge between the, my analog world and more of your digital world. And I think there are really exciting um, opportunities that we can explore together. So, well, obviously an alternative currency. Um, in, in my market, there is only one vendor who accepts Bitcoins. And I asked him, have you ever sold anything in Bitcoins? And he told me like once, yeah. I had a, a, this, uh, it was a foreign uh, guy, and he bought a piece of jewelry and he paid with bitcoins. And I was like, man, you know, like, that's quite something, you know, because uh, in Costa Rica, uh, bitcoins are quite unknown, you know. Maybe you've heard it once or twice in the news, but for the most part, it's uh, uh, an unknown uh, thing. And truly, I don't know, you know, like, how to implement this. To me, it sounds like a really cool idea. It feels it is moving on the right way, but I actually don't have a clue on how to implement it. I, it was yesterday, I, I, I needed like a, a Bitcoin 101 to use my card and put money into it and then uh, buy a coffee. And so um, I think there is a, a great opportunity here to, to collaborate then a web-based marketplace that it's um, also open sourced. So often farmers have to deal with this uncertainty that they have to harvest, then bring it to the market and cross their fingers that it will sell. So there's a different way, uh, an another opportunity where we could um, basically have like a an, an digital marketplace where they sell before harvesting, then uh, uh, therefore reducing the, the risk and bringing the already sold products to the marketplace where you can still um, meet and know each other. Then open sourcing. So this is one thing that we've been wanting to do, but again, we, because we're not that tech savvy, we really don't know how to go about it. So these tents that we did with bamboo and recycled bicycle tires and, and, and the tables and pretty much everything we've done, we have this like longing of making it open source and available to other people who want to create these sort of markets. Um, but again, we really don't know how to go about it. it even if you see our website is uh, it's uh, it's truly it's 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 a bit shameful you know it seems like a 15 year old uh, um, like a website that i mean there's a lot of room of improvement and then the other thing are hackathons which is something that i just recently discovered um, the possibility of blending like these land-based uh, necessities with the makerspace digital potential to create tools that are appropriate for small-scale farming, which is something that is uh, surprisingly hard to find. Typically, farming tools are this huge machinery, uh, which are, you know, are in the logic of monocultures and industrial farming. But for organic, family-scale, small farms, there is very little uh, tools available. And I think that that's another bridge that the um, digital uh, hacker world can uh, contribute to these more land-based um, uh, projects. Um, and one thing that I missed uh, before was by doing this approach to a market, then you have a more of a kind of like peer-to-peer -peer relationship between the co-creators and the enjoyers. So for example, a lot of the enjoyers that come to the market, they, when they travel, they bring seeds. And they say, could you please grow this for me? You know, once you have it, I will um, 
for sure buy it from you. And then that creates a, like a, an even greater market. And this is the case of, um, for you, kale is a, something that is really common, but in Costa Rica was pretty much unknown before this market. And it was exactly this uh, relationship that was able to introduce kale in Costa Rica now is like super popular and lots of farmers grow it. So it's again, it's redefining that relationship that is more based on, on a community of, um, of a shared interest and less of a transaction of unknown people. So um, thank you very much. Uh, and I don't know if anybody has uh, questions. Anyone ready? Have you prepared questions? Thank you very much. Uh, that was great. Something that really touched my heart. Mm. Um, I didn't hear the beginning, though. Uh, where did you get the money to start everything? Because it seems we live in the Czech Republic, in a very small town where there is a lot of land, people have no jobs, uh, there are a lot of people who know how to farm. I don't, so I really don't know how to start something like this. But we come across the same problem every time, every year. I actually, if I want to buy uh, organic food, organic vegetable, I have to actually bring it from Prague, mm. which is crazy, completely crazy. So we've been thinking about something like that, but we don't know how to start it or where to get money, because I, I assume you needed some money to start this. So the, the, the first part of our process was just this burning heart just coming together and really trying to um, dream it and have like a you know like the concept and a, a, and a strategy and then we were looking for money and we couldn't find it and we couldn't find it and we couldn't find it um, and then eventually one day we said you know what screw this we're just gonna put a date and we're gonna say that we're gonna open and and we're gonna just uh, expect a miracle and um, what happened was we set up a date and then randomly I met the ambassador of the UK in Costa Rica um, through like he I went to this presentation he gave a talk that uh, actually inspired me and at the end of the thing I went backstage I just like uh, infiltrated to the backstage and looked for him and said hey I have this idea of a market and W would you be willing to come to our office? We'll share an organic lunch with you and tell you about our story. And so we showed him like the, the little model um, at this meeting. And he said, well, if you build one true scale, I will consider helping you. We build the thing, ask for the second, um, the second uh, meeting. And when we, he got there, we, he was quite impressed. He said, wow, you know, this is a really cool tent. Uh, so um, when would you need the money? And by that time, if I recall, uh, if I remember correctly, we were three weeks from the opening day. And we still had no money, no tents, and no, no clue. And we said, uh, well, in three weeks, we're going to open the market. So we need the money as soon as possible. And he said, Oh my God! No, you, it, this is impossible. The the you know the embassy can has never given money so quickly. And and I said, Mr. Ambassador, how can I say this? We believe in miracles, and we asked for one, and then you showed up. So you know, at this point, it's pretty much up to you. And uh, <laughs> he was quite. Uh, baffled by the, the reply, uh, but the truth is that less than a week after we got $5,000 and that's what it really took in money, $5,000 to build a tent, the first generation. We started with just 20 something vendors, now it's 130 something, uh, but when we started it was just 20 something vendors and maybe a couple hundred um, enjoyers coming every week and then it just grew exponentially uh, from that point on. 
after that, once we were open and we were more, we, we had some sort of reputation, um, the UN uh, gave us twenty thousand dollars to uh, uh, get a, like a, a, a place to put the tents, uh, like a like a little container warehouse kind of thing, and build some more tents and other stuff. And then, but for the most part, it was just money that we created through the event. So each vendor um, pays a fee to be there. And, and just, you know, a lot of volunteering work, though. Yeah, so you, you, that's why you need a burning heart. You know, this cannot happen on a conventional commercial scheme. It would be a terrible business. <laughs> okay, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I would like to ask you, uh, did you face any problem inside your team when you're starting? So regarding communication between you and so on, thanks. We face problems at the beginning, in the middle, at the end, right now, it's, you know, it's a... Um, w the thing that I learned was that even if you have a group of people that you truly love and you truly admire, just by the sheer interaction, you get in trouble, you know, like, there's misunderstandings, there's uh, everybody's holding their own um, um, issues, and then when you combine your issues with their issues, then sometimes it can be a bit explosive. Um, at the end of the day, it was about really trying to stay with an open heart, you know, and, and truly speak from your heart and say, like, you know what, um, when you said or did this, um, I interpreted this way and made me feel in this other way. So, you know, also taking responsibility of your feelings and, how, and, and your interpretation, because what I found is that often it was just the interpretation part that created the most of the conflict. It wasn't ac the actions themselves, but more of the interpretation. And when the other person says, oh, well, actually what I meant was this or that, or what I was trying to accomplish was, you know. So things slowly um, settle down, and at the end you end up with a more mature uh, group of people. But definitely conflicts are, you know, at the order of the day. Yeah. I'm guessing in your cities that there's, there are supermarkets and other outlets for crappy globalized food that's really cheap. Um, so I'm wondering what the price differential is between the Feria Verde and, and the global systems and whether poor people actually come to the Feria Verde. That's a great question. Um, so, what happens in Costa is that we have farmers' markets that have been hijacked by, like, intermediaries, and they sell at a price that is basically driving small farmers to poverty, bankruptcy, they're losing their land, and it's a pretty tragic situation. If you compare our prices to their prices, we are 50% more expensive. Um, if you go to an upper-class supermarket and buy, like, not organic, just conventional products, it's roughly the same price range. So, uh, one of the criticisms we've faced is that our produce is pricey. To that, uh, it really breaks my heart that mm, there are people who cannot pay the fair price for something, but then the real problem is not that we are selling too expensively, because I deeply believe that we're selling at the point where we are allowing our producers to have a dignified life and cover all the production costs. There's no externalized costs going on. They're taking full responsibility of their, of their uh, ecological footprint. So I think that we're selling at the fair price. The problem is that there are poor people, and that's a wider problem. So, um, if you don't have a lot of money, 
um, I have seen people that come to my market and they find like creative ways. And if you're really committed to eating organic, then there are other strategies. So, for example, you can uh, volunteer, well, not volunteer, but uh, work with the vendors at the market. So you get like a massive discount or even like free produce. You, if you have a garden, you can mingle with them and get, you know, like tips and seeds and uh, certain things to grow your food in your garden or a part of it. Um, there's a, a new uh, movement of community gardens where you can get involved and again get access to this food. Um, but in a monetized way, if you are poor, you basically cannot go to this market, unfortunately. Yeah. Anyone else wants to ask a question? Don't be shy. <laughs> if not, we still have time, so I will ask a question. Um, what would you say are the major differences between these markets in Costa Rica and the fair markets or farmers markets here in Europe? Well, the main difference that I see is that I'm, I'm, I, I don't, I mean, I, I'm going to talk from the markets that I've seen in Europe. I, I don't know if it's. Uh, a valid generalization, but the ones that I've seen are typically quite small and you have strictly just the vending part. So you have the producer and, you know, you do have that relationship that comes along with meeting the people who produce your food and that's beautiful. But then in our proposal, it's much more holistic in the sense that we have like a recycling center, we have like activism activities, there are sports activities, arts activities, um, there is uh, a wider offer, so it's not just produce, but it, there's also like clothing, toys, cosmetics, uh, housekeeping products, um, there's a, like a restaurant with, with a food court. Um, so at the end, it has a feel more like a big celebration. And uh, actually, that's one uh, very crucial part of the success of this market is that uh, it has a feel of like a big party. You go there and it's so fun and you meet so much people and it's, you know, like there's so many things to do. And so you can buy your food and then you can spend three or four more hours just mingling and, you know, meeting people, uh, tasting things and just socializing. And in that sense, I, I, I think has this... Um, community building um, component that I haven't seen as present in like other like uh, uh, farmers markets here in Europe and, and also in, in, in other countries that I've been. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone wants to react? <laughs> Well, do you have any um, program or w would it be possible to come to visit you and learn what you are doing and kind of, you know, see like a um, like an internship or something, you know? Um, not, not officially, but uh, I suppose that if you want to go, we can just figure something out. Yeah. Yeah. But we don't have like an official uh, uh, training program. Uh, one of my dreams is to create a like a um, digital like a video um, a workshop kind of thing so uh, so you wouldn't need to fly to the other side of the world that you could actually just download a set of videos and know how to build a tent how to relate to your farmers how to um, do the organic certificate like um, management uh, how to reach out to the community and, and so on, you know, like all the different aspects of what we do. Uh, I would love to have that being like completely open source um, in, in the format of video. That's one of my many dreams. Um, and I also want to invite any, you know, if you have uh, any knowledge on the, on the wi wish list to please approach me and, you know, like uh, let's start a conversation about it. Um. Oh, 
Oh, my email address. Um, I suppose you can meet me right outside here. Um, it's, well, I don't know if this would be helpful, but it's quite easy. It's Francisco at feriaverde.org. Oh my God, that's a lot. <laughs> so this is Feria Verde, this is a V. So Francisco at feriaverde.org. That's my email. Um, and I will mingle around as, as well. I'll be here today and tomorrow. Well, we still have time for one last question. Does anyone want to ask a question? Okay. My last question. As for the farmers, um, do they do it for for living? Is is uh, being the the farmers, the sellers at these markets? Is it their main source of income, or are they still dependent on the supermarkets, or yeah. is is it just a hobby for them? Or? Thanks for asking that. Um, the farmers, the the art, like the typical story of my farmers was they were a conventional farmer. They got terribly sick. They almost died. And then by health issues, they became organic. Then they were struggling even more because, you know, a small farmer with higher production costs and so on. And it was until they found this uh, market with a different kind of like a... Um, public and people who really value their work, they multiplied their income uh, several times. So for example, Don Sergio, this guy here, he lost about half of his farm before, before the market. He was about to lose the second half of his farm. And on the regular market, he was doing like... Um, something like 35 to 70 dollars a week so costa rica is not a cheap country by the way so 70 dollars a week is basically it's pretty much extreme poverty um when he started the the market like one year after being in, at the feria verde and having people who truly value his work he is making now um somewhere in between Four hundred and seven hundred dollars a week, uh, just because he has access to three thousand people, you know, that come and really value his. Uh, um, so now he's uh, debt free. He was able to support his daughter that got really sick because of the um, uh, early exposure to agrochemicals in in, in her childhood, and. Same as Don Sergio, you know, like many of my farmers have this kind of like um, similar story of how they were basically in a horrible economical crisis. And it was through accessing a market that truly valued their work that they were able to um, make a dignified living. So uh, the quick answer to your question is yes, this is their livelihood. This is the market represents their main income. And through the market, they did a lot of connections with other businesses like restaurants and um, hotels and, and so on that complement that uh, income. We estimated that about 500 people receive their main income um, related to the Feria Verde. So, and, and, and when. It, if you put this in perspective, like 500 people, you know, you could say 500 jobs in the sense that is the livelihood of 500 people that came out of a project of a bunch of like dreaming hippies uh, who started with $5,000 and just a lot of volunteering time. I believe, you know, it's truly remarkable. If you go to the government as a company and say, I will bring 500 uh, jobs, they put the red carpet for you, you know, that you get all sorts of uh, benefits. But if you're just a group of, uh, a small group of committed citizens, um, it's quite a different road. And so I believe that, I feel very proud actually that we were able to create this through such a literal, um, uh, with, with such a humble beginning, yeah. 
congratulations then and thank you for your presentation. Thank you, thank you for choosing the session. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of the day.